Hey, Christ Community Church family, thank you so much for tuning in today. Happy, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. And since I'd never be able to do this, hi, Mom, and happy Mother's Day. To all the moms today, I hope you are encouraged, blessed, and find a moment to be refreshed. If you have a care need or prayer request, please fill out the form on the front page of our website, cccnow.com, and a care pastor will get in contact with you. If you are looking to get connected during this time, visit the staff page on our website and get your kids and students connected with one of our youth pastors or check out our adult discipleship staff and get yourself plugged in. Before we enter into a time of singing together, would you bow your heads with me and pray? Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray for every heart tuning in that we'd be able to engage in your word, engage in worship, and learn to love you in a new way and a whole way. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Sunday evening service. We're here to worship together. We're going to sing a song, Drenched in Love, talking about the precious love of God. Here we go. No precious is the flow. No precious is the flow that makes me wide.
that his grace is sufficient for everything. Let's not forget that.
Who is the king of your heart? Or what is the king of your heart? I think for a lot of us, we become incredibly comfortable with all kinds of things of the world becoming the kings of, and rulers of our hearts and our lives. In this song, there's an invitation to invite Jesus to be the king of your heart and the king of your life. And I'm just going to encourage us into a time of confession, into a time of acknowledging God as king and as Lord. And as we do that, I'm going to close this out for a few minutes. are the king of our hearts, God. Everything that we are will become, Lord God, as a result of you working, moving, transforming hearts and lives, Lord God, calling us to you. Lord God, I just pray, especially in this time, God, that we would be people, God, that are known for the praise that is on our hearts, Lord God, that we would be people that are known for the love that we have for you, God, that we'd be willing to lay aside earthly kings, God, and embrace you as king, as lord, as worthy, as holy. God, be glorified in us because you are good. And you are good, good, oh, and you are good, good. Hi moms, happy Mother's Day. We wanna take this time as a church family to celebrate you, to give thanks for you. And uh, as a celebration of all of our moms, take a look at these tributes. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> um, I love you so much, mommy. You take care of me, you give me food. There's no one, there's no mommy I could ever love in this whole entire world more than you. My mom has always been there for me, and I love her to death. She, I look up to her. She knows the answer to all of my questions. She knows how to help me with anything I have a problem with. I mean, we've been through it all together. And mom, if you're seeing this, I just wanted to say I love you and happy Mother's Day. What are you thankful for, boo-boo? Um, thankful for mommy when me and baby coming. Aww. I'm thankful for mommy's kindness. I'm thankful that mommy can stand with her annoyingness and I love her. <laughs> well, I, love I love mommy because she's mommy. I love mommy because she reads to me. I love mommy because she's awesome. Happy Mother's Day. I love you, Mom. I just want to say that I love how you take care of other people like they are kids, even if they aren't. And I love you, and I know everyone does too. So, Happy Mother's Day. Hi. Um, what I love most about my mom is that she's always super strong. What I love most about my mom is that she's very kind. What I love most about my mom is she's always super loving. Mm, we love you, Mommy. <laughs> love you. Love you, Mom. 
Okay, yeah. what I love most about my mom is how accepting she is of others. She she knows that no matter what you look like or what you do, that God still loves you, and she shows that love to others. Um, my mom has never tried to push us to be anything that we're not, and that's what I love about her. What I love about my what I love most about my mother is her unconditional love and her friendship. Because my mom is not just my mom, but she's also my best friend. What I love about my mom is she loves spending time with all of us, and she makes time to do that. She's so kind, and it's a lot of fun hanging out with her. My favorite thing about my mom is that she's a really good listener, and she always listens to people's problems and what's going on in their life. She's super accepting of me and. Even when people aren't gracious towards her, she still is there for them. And she's always so kind to everyone she meets. I like that she is so sweet. She cares for me a lot. And she's the best mommy I can ask for. And I love all the things she has taught me. I love you, Mom. I like that Mom makes food for all of us. I like mommy because he made my cat. Mom, we love you. Mom, we love mommy. you, mommy. Um, we love mommy. you, mommy. I love you, mommy. I love you when you're playing with me, and I love you so much. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Thank you for being so understanding, loving, caring, and kind to me since the day I was born. You raised me to be a follower of God and a lover of people, and I want to thank you for blessing those around you. I hope that you have a wonderful day and remember that you are loved and happy Mother's Day, Mom. Love you. What I love about our mom is that she goes on bike rides with us. What I love about my mom is that she gives us big hugs. Happy, happy Mother's, Mother's Day. day. Corrine is my kid's mom. Um, she's been awesome from the time they were babies through uh, grade school and high school and driving to different events through college and even after college, what we call refeathering the nest. She's been awesome. She's been a rock. I love her billions. I love her forever. Thanks for this opportunity. Happy Mother's Day. One thing that I really value about my mom is that she's such a good listener and I can always confide in her and she gives the best advice. We love you, Mom! Because you care for us. Because you're always there when we need you most. Because you work hard to support our family. Hi. And my favorite thing about my mom is being a police officer. Happy Mother's Day. Bye. Thank you for being an example in my life of how to love God and love people to the fullest. Thank you for doing embarrassing things when I was younger, like telling me that you love me in front of my friends. Well, I love you, Mom. And to you, and to my mother-in-law, and to all the moms out there, happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Mom! Paxton, what do you love about Mom? Uh, I love Mom because she's my best mom. Because she helps me with homework, and she's the best mom ever. Happy Mother's, Happy Day, Mother's Day, Mom! Day. Let's pray together. Lord, as we celebrate Mother's Day, we want to thank you for these women that you used in our lives to give us life, uh, to model who you are, to sacrifice, to nurture, to care for us in our deepest needs, emotional, spiritual, physical. Lord, we thank you for our mothers and the ways that you've worked in their lives and you've modeled beauty. And Father, the way that they have been our friend and our companion, but also uh, the disciplinarian and the one who's pointed the way. Thank you, Lord, for the fact that they show us all about what love, acceptance, and forgiveness is. So, Father, today we especially want to pray for all moms that they would experience your blessing. And we remember those mothers today, Lord, who are alone and, and maybe separated and unable to be with their family. Give a special blessing to each one of them. And, Father, we always remember on Mother's Day, too, uh, those who've lost children. And we pray for your tender touch and your blessing. Father, as we continue to move through this time of worship, let us be overwhelmed with your heart, the heart of a mother that you talk about, that you have for us, the blessing of your love. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. During my three years as a missionary, I experienced firsthand the obedience of God's people being cheerful givers. 
My husband and I are intentional to make giving to the church and God's kingdom an important value in our marriage and faith walk. The money God gives us is not for us to hold onto with a tight grip, but to trust Him and give back with an intentional offering. There are three ways you can participate in giving. My husband and I, we give online at cccnow.com. You can mail in your offering as well, or drop it off to me in the front desk between 9 a.m. and 12 p.m. Happy Mother's Day. Uh, we are celebrating with you. We appreciate you moms. Thank you so much for being with us today. I also want to pause and acknowledge those who are, are hurting today. Um, I know that Mother's Day can be a difficult time for some people, and so I just want to let you know that we are with you, we are praying for you, we love you, and we are so glad that you have joined us as well. I do want to take a moment, though, and say Happy Mother's Day to my mom. Um, just have this platform to, to share with you how great my mom is. Normally, she would be here in the room with me uh, here today listening to me preach. And so while I am mourning uh, the fact that she doesn't get to be in here and you all don't get to be in here, um, I did want to take the time just to say, uh, Mom, I love you. You are so amazing. Um, you are one of the most gracious, wonderful, loving people that anyone ever gets to know. Um, and thank you for setting an example of what it looks like to love Christ and to love others the way that Christ loved them. And, and my mom, for those of you who may not know her, she... Um, not only has loved her kids and grandkids so well, but every kid, every student that she's ever come in contact with, uh, she is like a mom to all of them and has just set that example of what it looks like to love people well. And so I am so grateful for your influence in my life, mom, and uh, for the way that you've taught me to be a parent and a follower of Christ. And, and so I just want to say thank you. I love you. Happy Mother's Day. I also want to let you know that this is your Mother's Day present. Um, I think that was nice enough. So uh, you're not getting anything else from me, so love you. Well, hey, raise your hand if you still watch the TV show Survivor. Great, two of you, yeah, just like normal. I, I've been preaching for a while now, and I've been trying to tell you that Survivor is great, and it doesn't seem like it's gaining any influence here, and so I'm beginning to think that people aren't listening to me while I preach, which I am offended by. No, hey, uh, I love Survivor, and... We are in season 40 of Survivor, actually. And so what they've done is they've taken 20 winners and put them together in what's called Winners at War. And so it's fascinating because you have the normal gameplay and the normal relational stuff that's going on in Survivor. But you, you also have this added dimension where a lot of these players have known each other for a long time. Some of these players have known each other for 5, 10, 15 plus years. And so they're coming together and playing this game where you have to vote people out and where you have to lie to some people and you have to backstab some people. And, and it's a really interesting dynamic seeing friends and relationships from a long time and how they navigate the gameplay together. And one of those relationships, there's, um, there's these two people on the show. Uh, one is named Tony and one is named Sarah. And Tony and Sarah, this is actually their third season playing together, which is kind of unique. And so Tony won the first time they played together. Sarah won the second time they played together. And now here they are on, on their third season, Winners at War, competing, and they've joined forces together in many ways. But a couple episodes ago, Tony made the decision to vote out one of Sarah's friends in the game, one of her allies in the game. And he didn't tell Sarah about it. And so after that episode ended, uh, the, the next episode started with their conversation back at the camp. And you can imagine that Sarah was a, a little bit unhappy, right? She was angry, and she's not a passive-aggressive person. She's not just someone who's not going to talk to Tony or ignore him. Um, she went after him and was yelling at him and saying, you blew up our game, you, you ruined this for us. And Tony's like, no, 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 it's okay, we're, we're doing great. By the way, if you haven't seen Survivor, that was a perfect Tony impression. Um, and if you have seen Survivor, it didn't even sound anything like him, so great. Um, but so, so Tony's trying to calm Sarah down, and Sarah's saying, you know, you, you ruined our game. And then she says something. She says, hey, I will continue to work with you right now, but when this thing blows up, and it will blow up, um, we are done. And it was fascinating, because she didn't just mean in the game. She, she meant their real-life friendship, their real relationship. Tony's like, no, 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 come on. Like, we're still going to be together. And, 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 and she's saying, no, like, we, we are done. We are not friends anymore. Like, we will, we will be through when this thing blows up. And so Tony, you see him that whole next episode, he's trying to rebuild this relationship with Sarah, trying to repair the damage that had been done. Have you ever been there? 
You ever had to rebuild a relationship? Maybe it's not a relationship, but the, the truth is building and rebuilding, these are natural parts of our lives. And so maybe you've had to rebuild a, a toy, you've had to rebuild a, a piece of furniture, maybe you've rebuilt uh, a home or you've rebuilt a car or something along those lines. Building and rebuilding, they're, they're such a natural part of our lives. But the truth is that the opposite of that is also a natural part of our lives. Neglecting building and neglecting rebuilding can be very natural, right? You, maybe, maybe you're the person who took your car into the mechanic and uh, the mechanic comes out and says, yeah, uh, it's not, like your car is done, it's dead, it's not going to work. And you're like, well, what, what happened? He's like, well, you know, you probably should have had an oil change once every, like, I don't know, at least five years. It would have been good. You know, gotten some belts changed, done some maintenance on it, but you neglected the maintenance, you neglected the fixing, you neglected the rebuilding, and so now you're left with nothing. And so here's the reality. There are times where, yes, we, we choose to neglect, but there comes a time where we have to say, now is the time to get it done. Now is the time to build. Now is the time to rebuild. And that's exactly what the Israelites did when they were living in Babylon. There came a time where they were able to go back to Jerusalem, go back to Israel, go back to being a nation. And they had to collectively say, hey, now is the time to rebuild our city. Now is the time to rebuild our lives. And so if you've got a Bible, you can turn to Nehemiah chapter 2. We're going to be in there in just a moment. But I want to make sure that we understand where we're at. And so what's happened is Israel is God's chosen people. This is God's nation. This is the people that he was going to use to be a light to the world. And so before they officially became the nation of Israel, before they entered the promised land, God looks at them, God tells them, he says, hey, if you are obedient to my commands, if you follow after me, if you put me first and you worship me and you don't worship other gods, you don't try and be like all the other nations, then I will be your God and I will protect you. Like I will give your enemies into your hands. But if you're disobedient to me, then I'm going to remove my protection and basically saying, you'll be on your own. And so what we see in the book of Judges and Samuel and Kings and in these history books of Israel, we see that the Israelites failed over and over and over again. They made mistake after mistake after mistake, constantly neglecting the laws of God, being disobedient to God, constantly worshiping other gods and trying to be like, all these other nations. And so God would remove his protection from them and he would wait until they cried out. And when they cried out, he was faithful and responded and saved them again. And when they ran back to him, he was waiting there with open arms. It's actually a beautiful picture of God's grace because over and over and over again, they failed and they disobeyed God. They rebelled against him. And yet over and over and over again, he welcomed them back with open arms, just waiting for them to return home to him. And so there came a time in Israel's history where once again they had neglected being obedient to God and had chosen to worship other gods and try and be like every other nation. And so God gave them over to the hands of the Babylonians. And Babylon came in and they started pulling the Israelites out of their homes and taking them into Babylon. And they were in exile in Babylon for about 70 years. And after 70 years, they begin returning home. And so Zerubbabel led a group and he rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. And then Ezra led a group home and he started trying to rebuild obedience to God, obedience to the word of God. And then finally, we talked about this a few weeks ago, Nehemiah was still in Babylon and he was told that, that the walls of Jerusalem were still torn down, that the gates were still left in ashes. And so Nehemiah realized now is the time to go home and to rebuild to go home and to build Jerusalem back up to what it once used to be. And so he first, he started by offering up prayer. What an important first step. He offered prayer. And then he was able to go to the king, Artaxerxes, and ask to go to Jerusalem to rebuild. And the king sent him, and he asked the king for lumber, and the king gave him lumber. He asked the king for protection, and the king gave him protection. God's hand was on him during this time. And so he goes into Jerusalem, and he tours the city, and he looks around at the, the walls and the destruction and, and the gates that are burned down, and he sees the devastation for himself. He sees the brokenness for himself, and so he gathers the Israelite people, the Jewish people, together, and this is what he says in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. 
He says, then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. Nehemiah went and he toured the city. He toured Jerusalem and he went around and inspected the walls and the gates and he saw the devastation for himself. And he gathered the people together and he said, hey, look around you. Look at the glory that has been destroyed. Look at the city that lies in ruins. Now is the time to rebuild. And so they need to rebuild their walls. They need them for protection, but they also need them to bring some glory to the city the place that used to be the house of God's presence, the holy city of Jerusalem. And Nehemiah was saying, now is the time. And here in 2020, I think that we are saying that same thing, that now is the time to build God's kingdom, to rebuild God's kingdom. So many of us are thinking, yes, we we know now is the time to rebuild, right? We We've been focused on maybe rebuilding our health for some of us. And and many of us were thinking, all right, now is the time to rebuild our economy. Now is the time to rebuild our jobs. Now is the time to rebuild our our communities, whether that's schools or sports or our church. Now is the time to rebuild some of our habits and our routines that have gone away. Now is the time to rebuild some of our leisure activities, right? For myself, I'm like, now is the time to rebuild going to Disneyland. I want to be there. I want to do that. That sounds fun. Who's with me? Anyone? No? Okay, great. Now is the time to rebuild. And while all those things are great and all those things are important, there's something that's even more significant that we need to focus our heart and attention on. You see, while Nehemiah was tasked with building the wall around Jerusalem, we are tasked with building God's kingdom into our hearts and into the world around us. We are tasked with being kingdom builders. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is teaching people how to pray. And, and most of you probably know this. He says, this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are supposed to be kingdom builders in our prayers. We're supposed to pray for God's kingdom to rule and reign in our lives and in the world around us. In Matthew 28, the entire Gospel of Matthew really talks about building God's kingdom. But in Matthew 28, Jesus, uh, as he is ready to ascend into heaven, he gives the great commission where he says, Now go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Jesus sends us out to be kingdom builders, to make disciples. to to teach people about who God is, to baptize them in his name, to welcome them into his family, to show them how to be obedient to him, to show them how to place God's throne in our hearts, to let God be on the throne of our hearts. We are to be kingdom builders in our lives and in the world around us. And, And yet in some ways, in our own hearts, we have neglected the work of building God's kingdom. Or we have begun to put other things in the place uh, of God. We begin to put other things on the throne of God in in the place that is rightfully his. And and so we need to rebuild God's kingdom into our lives, into our hearts. And, And so how do we do that? How do we build God's kingdom? How do we rebuild God's kingdom? What does that look like in our lives and in our world? Well, let's just start with ourselves. The first thing that we need to do is we need to evaluate. We need to evaluate. See, Nehemiah went around the city and he, he, he looked at the walls and he saw the gates and then he brought the people together. And he said, you see the trouble we are in Jerusalem. He points out the trouble. He points out, out the brokenness. Here's what I find really interesting about that. The people were already there. Like the people were already living in Jerusalem. They were living in, in the midst of the mess and in the midst of the chaos and the midst of the brokenness. Why had no one else said, hey, let's go rebuild? Why does Nehemiah even have to point out that things are not the way they should be? I think sometimes in life we can get so used to 
the brokenness, so familiar with things that aren't, aren't the way they should be, that, that it just becomes normal. Right? Like maybe there's something around your house that is broken that, that you have been neglecting, fixing, and, and you don't even pay attention anymore. You don't even think about it until you invite someone else to your house or someone's like house sitting for you and you're trying to kind of give them instructions. You're like, oh yeah, the fridge, uh, it's a little bit tricky. You have to open and close the door three times. And on the third time, you have to reach behind the fridge and grab the back of it with your left hand and, and, and hold the door with your right hand and slam them together. And, and then while you're holding them, like kick the bottom part of it um, about three inches in, and it'll stay closed. And, and we think that that's normal because we've gotten so used to the brokenness. We've gotten so used to the things that aren't functioning, aren't working the way that they're supposed to. And, and when we talk about God's kingdom reigning in our hearts, we've gotten so used to other things having the throne that we just think that it's normal. So we need to evaluate. And we don't have to wait until this whole like quarantine time is done. As a matter of fact, some of you have had that opportunity. You've been looking at your life and you've been saying, hey, you know what, there's some areas where God is not ruling and reigning in my heart, where, where God's kingdom has not been built fully into my life. And some of you have already been making changes during this time. Some of us need to start that now. We don't need to wait uh, until we're out of this thing. We need to start now building God's kingdom. Now is the time to make this happen. And so some of you, you've come face to face with this because maybe you've been home an extra 15 to 20, uh, 15 to 20, um, 45 to 50 hours a week. I mean, maybe you've only been home an extra 15, 20 hours a week. Um, and, and you've realized that, that God's kingdom is not reigning in your marriage. Maybe you've realized that, that you have not been a godly husband or you've not been a godly wife. You've not loved your spouse in the way that God would want you to. Maybe you're, you're realizing that God has not reigned and ruled in your family. You guys don't even know how to communicate, and you're just like ships passing in the night. And maybe God has even been working in this time to rebuild some of those relationships. Maybe as parents, you're realizing, like, I, I, don't, I don't know how to teach my kids. I don't know how to coach my kids. I don't know how to disciple my kids. I don't know how to raise my kids. Because so often, we just we take them to school, and then we pick them up and drop them off at sports. And then we pick them up, and we drop them off at youth group. And then, you know, it's on to the next thing. And then it's going to bed, and, and we're moving on. And so as parents, maybe some of us are, are learning how to reincorporate God's kingdom into our parenting. Maybe you're rebuilding God's kingdom in, into your work. And, and as you've taken a step back from your normal work practices, you realize, you know, some of the things that I was doing weren't very godly, weren't very honoring to him. Maybe you're realizing that you need to rebuild God's kingdom into the way that you love your community. Church, I'm ashamed a, a to say, and I hope that you'll forgive me and not judge me too harshly for this, um, that I have not been a good, loving neighbor to my community. As a matter of fact, um, when quarantine started, there were a lot of conversations of Christians who were saying, man, you know, one of the, the joys of this time is that I'm getting to be with my neighbors and talk with them and, um, you know, share Christ with them and share God's love with them in ways that I never have before. And I was sitting there thinking, I've lived in my neighborhood for five years, five and a half years now, and, and, and I maybe know three or four people's names. As a matter of fact, it was only two months ago, right before the, the quarantine stuff started, that, that I learned my direct neighbor's name. We've lived next to each other for, for five years. Our doors face each other. They're about 10 yards apart. And, and I'm sad to say that I've been feeling that need to, uh, to demonstrate Christ's love to him and to be a witness, but I'm scared to do it, and, and, and I've just pushed it off for many reasons. And after a couple of weeks in quarantine, seeing him more regularly, I finally was like, okay, I need to at least just have a basic conversation. And so I said hi, and we started talking, and, and just to demonstrate how bad things have been, my kids come up to me as I'm having a conversation with him, and, you know, we're just talking about work and quarantine and different things like that, and, and I'm having a conversation, and my kids are coming up, and they're saying, Daddy, who is that? Daddy, do you know that person? Daddy, why are you talking to that person? Do you know who he is? They were so confused that I would have a conversation with our neighbor who they don't know because myself as a Christian has neglected being an example of Christ's love to that person. So often I come home and I seek comfort and I want to turn everything off. And I think this is my place to be comfortable, not my place to be a light. And so it's something I'm working on and I could use prayer for, but I've realized that I need to build God's kingdom back into the way that I love 
my community and to the way I love my neighborhood. Maybe you've realized that you need to build God's kingdom back into your identity because you realize that your identity has been placed in your work, it's been placed in your finances, it's been placed in your relationships, and you realize that all those things can be taken away. And you need to let God reign and be God, let, let God be the one who tells you who you are, who defines you. And so here's what I want to say. As we evaluate our lives, the temptation is to look for these big, giant pitfalls. The temptation is to say, well, I've never murdered anyone, so I'm okay. The temptation is to say, well, I've never committed adultery, so I'm okay. I'm not a meth addict, so I'm okay. I, I, I don't have an alcohol problem, so I'm okay. I, I've never stolen from a store, so I'm okay. The temptation is to look for these major pitfalls and say, well, I've, I haven't neglected any of those. Right? I, haven't, I haven't fallen trapped with, to any of those. And so therefore, I'm fine. But that's not what Scripture teaches us. The problem is that for so many Christians, we have this slow decline where we start removing God from his throne and we start placing other things there. And for so many of us, what we're doing is we're breaking the first and second commandment to have no other gods before him and to not worship any idols. Like, that's what so many of us do. I want you to think about this. When, when we went into quarantine and, and, you know, things started shutting down, many people, at least at the beginning, had a little bit more downtime. Did you immediately go and say, wow, I have more time to be in the presence of God. I have more time to be in worship. I have more time to be in prayer. I have more time to be in the word. I have more time to go and, and love people. Or, or did you say, I have more time to binge my favorite TV show? See, so many of us, we turn to Tiger King when we should have been turning to the King of Kings. Okay, I actually don't know if that was funny or if that was like an amen moment or if that was just super cheesy. But you know what? It felt good up here, all right? So that's all that really matters. But we should be turning that time over to God because he's our first priority. I want you to think about this as we think about a slow decline and what that really looks like. I, I saw this, uh, this video clip of a late night show and they were talking about how Americans don't read. Now, you can be mad at America or kids these days or the educational system or whatever. Um, just do that later because this is a spiritual point I'm trying to make. So they went around the streets of New York and they were asking these people um, to name a book. That's all they had to do was name a book. Any book would be fine. And so you had you know, six or seven of these people going, oh, um, oh man, I actually don't read. Oh, this is embarrassing. I can't think of one right now. Um, and, you know, they named movies and like ha ha more than half the movies out there are based off of books and they were naming ones that weren't. Um, but there was one girl in particular that caught my attention she was wearing a necklace, and she, like everyone else, was like, oh, I'm sorry, I don't read, I can't name a book, you know. But I looked at the necklace, and at the end of the necklace was a cross. A, a cross, as, a, as an article of clothing, as, as a necklace, is, is a symbol of someone saying, hey, I am a follower of Christ. Now, whether or not their hearts are committed to Christ, that's a different issue. But you are wearing that as a symbol of the resurrection, to say that I am a follower of Christ. That's, that's the main reason that you would wear something like that. And so a, a Christian woman, a follower of Christ, could not name a single book. And if you're not looking at me at the moment, I'm holding up my Bible for you. How sad is it that a Christian person could not even think to name the Bible as a book? But here's the truth. Even if you could name a book, how far down the line would the Bible come? How many books would you name before you got to the Bible? If someone were to ask you what you did in your free time or what you did with your time, how, how far down the list would, would the things of God fall into place? Would prayer and reading scripture fall into place? If someone asked you about your community, how far down the line would church fall? If someone asked you about who's the most important person in your life, how far down the line would Jesus be? The truth is, for many of us, we just have this slow decline where we start taking these, these things that are neither evil nor good, these things that are neither godly nor evil, and we just start placing them on the throne of our hearts. And so we need to evaluate our hearts to really evaluate our hearts and say, you know what, God, is there any part of my life that I have not been giving over to you, where I've been putting something else on your throne, where I haven't let you rule and reign, is there any area of our life where we need to rebuild 
the kingdom of God into it. Because we need to rebuild our hearts and the kingdom of God in our hearts before we're really able to successfully build God's kingdom out in the world. And so what do we do after we've evaluated? Well, the next thing, and we talked about this last week, is that, that we need to have a vision for the end. We need to have a vision for the end. Nehemiah actually gave the people a vision in verse 17. He said, look, Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been burned with fire. He said, come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. Now, I would have given a little bit more of a rah-rah speech there. You know, I would have, would have been able to go a little bit something like, hey, you know, our enemies see us as weak, but now we will be strong. Our walls may be burned down now, but we will rebuild. You know, I'm just, I'm just spitballing here, but um, that's where I would have. It takes a very simple approach. Hey, let's rebuild the walls. We can do this, and then we won't be in disgrace anymore. People are like, yeah, I don't want to be in disgrace. Let's go. Let's go to work. We need to get help. We need to get help. And this works in, in two ways. The first is that we need accountability. We, we need people who can come alongside of us and, and, and help make sure that we're doing the right thing. You know, I, I have been, um, I, I go through flows with my weight. And so um, there's times where I just eat too much and don't exercise and I gain weight and then I kind of hit a peak and then I'm like, all right, I got to get serious about this. And, you know, it's time to, to lose some weight and I'll get serious about my diet and exercise and all the things and I'll, I'll drop back down to where I want to be and I'll stay there for a while and then I'll go back up and down and, uh, you know, go through these flows. And so at the end of 2019, I was kind of at one of those, those high points and looking and saying, okay, I need to lose some weight. But, you know, it was November and Thanksgiving and uh, Christmas and December and something, you know, January is a great time to start. New year, new me, that whole thing. And we get into January and when, when January comes, it's, you know, I think my wife baked some stuff and my daughter's birthday was then. And so, you know, we have a lot of like sweets and goodies around. And, uh, and so it just didn't happen in January. I think, all right, let's move into February. But then February was my birthday and who wants to diet on their birthday? So, you know, I figured I'd just keep moving on. So I'm like, all right, March, like let's go to March and March will get serious about it. And then quarantine hit and got to get that quarantine 15 in, you know, and, um, you know, you're sitting at home alone. You're like, ah, no one's going to see me anyways. I might as well just eat whatever I want. It doesn't really matter. And so, March came and went, and I was like, all right, April, April is the time. I'm going to do this. I'm going to get serious about this. And then it was my son's birthday and my wife's birthday and um, my sister's birthday and my brother-in-law and sister-in-law's birthday. All these birthdays were happening, and, and, and so people were bringing treats and good, like dropping them off at our house so we could have like virtual birthday parties and things. And uh, so, you know, April just wasn't good. And, and it was right at the end of April, the beginning of May, it was like the first mo- or last Monday of April where I, I was... I was like, I have to get serious about this, right? Like, I have to lose, like, let's just lose one pound this week. And so Monday came and went, and Tuesday came and went, and uh, hadn't done anything the way that I was supposed to. And so by Wednesday, I finally decided, you know what, I need some accountability. And so I text this group of friends that I have and reached out to them and said, hey, guys, listen, I'm trying to lose some weight. I need some accountability. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, I-, I need to lose one pound by Monday. So that's five days away. I have five days to lose one pound. So if I don't do that, all of you have permission to slap me in the face the next time you see me. Now, I, I don't recommend the method necessarily, but you know what? For me, it worked. Um, I lost the pound, and, and now they continue to give me accountability and support and encouragement. Some of them are encouraging. Some of them are like, hey, when do we get to slap you still? Um, they're good friends. But, but the point is I needed accountability, and we all need accountability because we need someone who's going to check on us and say, hey, how are you doing it placing God as the king of your heart? How are you doing it letting God's kingdom reign in your marriage? Are you being a godly husband? Are you being a godly parent? Are you being a godly neighbor to your community? Are, are, are you evangelizing? Are you discipling someone? Have you been spending time in your word? Have you been spending time in prayer? Spending time in the presence of God? We need accountability. But also, especially as we move from internal to external building of God's kingdom, we weren't meant to do this alone. In Corinthians, Paul actually tells us that that we are the body of Christ, and each of us has a role to play. Each of us has a part to play. And and the Bible tells us that every Christian has at least one spiritual gift. See, none of us are are meant to be spectators. We are supposed to be participators in building God's kingdom. But we need to do that together in community with one another. So we need help. We also, we need to be devoted Following Christ, building God's kingdom, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. 
And, and so you might be able to get out quickly and, and do some things for a short time, but, but the reality is as, as we follow Christ and as we build God's kingdom, we're going to need devotion. That means every day we're going to have to wake up and, and say, God, today I'm going to be a kingdom builder. God, today I'm going to build your kingdom into my heart. God, today I'm going to serve you and follow after you. As a matter of fact, every transition that we make, we can say that same prayer. As we go in the morning from our homes to work or to school or to the grocery store, we can say, you know what, as I go in this next place, I'm going to be a kingdom builder here. As we return home, we can say, I'm going to be a kingdom builder here. As we go outside our house and just sit on our, our patios or in our driveways, we can say, you know what, I'm going to be a kingdom builder in my neighborhood. We can constantly remind ourselves that we're going to be kingdom builders in every moment of every day at all times. We need to be devoted. The reality is we're going to face opposition, we're going to face obstacles, and we need to be devoted and continue to push through. And finally, here's some really good news. All of this, the building of God's kingdom, the rebuilding even of God's kingdom in our hearts, it's not up to you. It's not up to you. As a matter of fact, Nehemiah, in verse 18, when he's talking about the walls being built, he said, he said I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me. He said, God has been in control. God is leading the way. And in chapter 6, after the walls have been built up, Nehemiah, Nehemiah actually says that his enemies were afraid because they knew that God had been a part of it. God had been a part of the work. God is in control. And so when we build God's kingdom into the world, we have to trust that he is in control. We have to constantly be seeking him out in prayer and saying, God, it's not up to me. It's not up to my gifts and talents, but it is you working through me and we just get to participate in what God is doing. He's leading the way. We're just coming along for the ride. And as we rebuild God's kingdom into our hearts, there is good news. Because we might look and evaluate and say, man, yeah, there's a lot of areas where I've been struggling. There's a lot of areas where I haven't been letting God rule and reign. But God is a God who is filled with grace. So much so that he would send his son to die on a cross to offer us salvation and forgiveness and a second chance. And so as we rebuild God's kingdom in our hearts, we turn our hearts over to God and we say, God, would you remove the obstacles in my way? Would you remove these distractions, these idols, these false gods away from me so that I can be fully devoted, fully committed to you? We are going to trust that God is going to do an amazing work in our hearts and in the world around us. Now is the time to turn our hearts over to God, to rebuild God's kingdom into our lives. Now is the time to build God's kingdom in the world around us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you are gracious, that when we make mistakes, that you offer forgiveness, that you offer a second chance, that you offer us a chance to rebuild your kingdom into our heart, into our lives. God, I thank you that you would invite us to participate in building your kingdom in the world around us. And so, God, I pray that we would be humble, willing servants. God, I pray that we would be a people who are willing to say, now is the time to give ourselves fully to God, to give our hearts fully to God, to give our hearts and our lives fully to you. God, would you remove any of the distractions, any of the things that would draw us away from you, anything that we have put on your throne in our hearts? God, would you remove those things so that we can be fully committed to you? And God, I pray that you would give us the strength and the wisdom and the help and the guidance to be kingdom builders in the world. God, now is the time for us to rebuild your kingdom into our hearts. Now is the time for us to rebuild your kingdom in the world, to build your kingdom in those places that have not been reached yet. And so God, lead and guide us in every step we take. We love you, Father, and we pray these things in your Son's name. Amen. Thanks to Ryan for sharing with us. As we continue to worship together, we're going to do so with a song. Love is 
and great are you, Lord, and worthy of all of our praise, God. The very breath that is in our lungs, Lord God, is from you. It is a gift from you each and every day, Lord God, as you are the one who is the giver of life. You are the one who goes before us and behind us and beside us in all that we do, Lord God. You bless us in all that we do, Lord God. You are such a good God, and we praise you. for joining us for the evening worship and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Have a great weekend.